All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming so many to this talk. Uh, thank you to Natalie for inviting me a little bit at last minute to fill in this gap. And um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, in a, such a beautiful crowd of dreamers. Uh, the subject of the session is uh, AI in EXA, artificial intelligence in uh, EXA. Um, it's a little bit early for me to be giving this talk today, so because I don't have any demo for you. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, clarify a little bit the field. What are we talking about? What are the technical options that are available to us? And uh, I will conclude by uh, telling you a little bit what we are doing at Unity in terms of AI. We have an ambitious. We are starting an ambitious program of. Uh, bringing more AI to Unity, okay? So first thing, what are we talking about? AI in Exa. First thing that comes to many naive people's mind, first thing they would think, oh, the behavior. We're making beautiful virtual realities and uh, we want to really get emotions and uh, involvement. Part of the magic comes from the behavior of your world, the behavior of your characters, the non-playable characters, NPCs behavior of a city, behavior of your story. So, so this is important for uh, application in terms of entertainment, but also for industrial sim simulation. There is um, a whole area for us to conquer in terms of uh, industrial simulation. Highest level of autonomous robots needs to be tested in an environment that looks very much like a game, when people can jump in and control some elements of the environment just to test the robot, the robot control software, how it would react in the real world. So for this kind of application too, we need realistic NPCs in the street so that the simulation is meaningful. So that one of the first things we could be thinking of when we are speaking of AI. Another one, which is often used as an excuse, uh, the first one is always used as an excuse not to do the second one. It's pretty similar, but it's Part of having a trustable behavior is to be able to solve hard problems. So there is still this problem. In games, we have hard problems, and in virtual reality, there are hard problems to solve for the characters in the world. And uh, to be believable, the NPCs must be smart. So this is also an issue. Slightly different angle to it. And the first, the first point is really about making bluffing behavior, and the second one, solving hard problems. But technically, it's not so different. We can also be thinking of storytelling. I like to put this here just to remind people that behavior is not, is not just for NPCs. It's for everything, including the story of your world, the overall evolution. We, we make the story that the, that the user experiments. OK, next point, content generation. This is a big one. Uh, lots of research is going on toward generating, automatically generating level for a game, dialogues. Uh, animations is a big thing, graphics. Okay, we will talk a little bit about that too. A point which is particularly important to people of Unity is uh, assisting the game and XR developer when they are building. How can we recommend assets? How can we recommend approaches? I won't speak much about this one today. All right, here is another very big chunk of AI. Perception. Perception, robotic perception is understanding the signals, the signals coming from your sensors. Are they cameras, lidars, sonars, radars, whatever? We receive a signal which is very cryptic and we, make, we must make sense of it. And, um, so, and this is particularly important in uh, VR, AR. We want the user to communicate very naturally with its environment, so natural language processing is important, motion recognition. Um, you want also your uh, augmented reality glasses to understand what they are seeing. Uh, and we can be dreaming also of the next Pokemon game, where the Pokemon will be hiding, actually, in a closet or in a trash can. You have to open it, and then you can see it, or you have to go behind the car. For this to be possible, your phone must understand that there is a trash can and a, and a car, and that in a trash can you can hide a Pokemon. So this is a big topic for us too, and I'm sure that plenty of people in this room are already aware about that. And um, I also put data science, understand and classify user. Basically, every industry has a problem of data science nowadays. There is a job for data scientists in every domain. 
I'd like to look at it a little bit of a particular angle for us. Um, so we have something. If we want to make something that is compelling and will generate emotions, there are theories that say that we tend to like things that are similar to us. So when somebody reacts in a way that you understand, you will kind of connect with it. So really, to be able to create a virtual reality or a game that will connect with people emotionally, emotionally, we must understand them. So we could envision a day where your video game or your virtual reality will go read your Facebook page and maybe your LinkedIn page and all your social media pages just to understand who you are so that they can propose you content that you like or you don't like. By playing behavior that you that are similar to you, you're going to make something that you like and make something which is very different from you. You're going to make something foreign and that you have problems liking and you might actually hate. So all this is a, this is a very, very big topic, impossible to cover in 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to try to give you an approximate view of this very complex field. So I'm going to have to make some cuts which are not super accurate. So maybe some AI scientists in the room would react. but. Uh, I have to simplify to make it understandable to you. So sometimes I will always raise a flag when I think I'm making a, an assertion which is a little bit too strong. But let's go. OK. Um, we have to go through that. Um, so that, now we have seen what we want to do. Let's look a little bit at the techniques we have. So over the last five years, deep learning has taken almost all the attention in terms of artificial intelligence. Uh, Nowadays, it's very hard to, to hear an AI talk, which is not about machine learning. Um, so there has been the world champion of Go being beaten, the autonomous robotics revolution, which I discuss a lot, crazy pictures appearing on the web. I will kind to explain to you how we can generate that. So what is deep learning? Very, very high level. Deep learning is huge networks of artificial neurons. I don't have time to explain to you what is a neuron. I will assume you all know. Um, these neurons are organized in very big network with several layers, hence deep, because we have up to several tens of layers. And this, these networks are trained. They are taught to perform a given task by providing them huge databases of examples. So this is a simple image recognition task, we're going to provide plenty of images, and with a label, this is an image of a cat, of a truck, and we would want the machine learning system to be able, after seeing all these examples, maybe millions of them, to recognize a cat from the input of the camera. Uh, how is this done practically? Practically, we would convert this database of images into huge matrix. Basically, each line is a, is a picture, and each column is a value RGB or gamma of a pixel in the picture. So imagine the size of the database. Really huge. Matrix of real numbers that don't have much meaning if you just look at them from a distance. We also have another vector of the labels for each picture. And so we process that to the network. We input the images. W is a set of the weights of the network, the connection. So you have connection on every, between every neuron, you have connection with the weight that we can evolve. And by evolving these weights, we teach the network. Teaching the network is just changing the weight so that at the end it produces the right output. And how is this done? We submit the picture to the network with the given, given the current weight in the network, we get an answer, predicted labels. I think this is a cat. We compare that to the real labels. And then we're going to change the weight a little bit so that next time we do better. This is basically making a very small step in the direction of reducing the error of the network on this database. And this is learning. This is nothing more than a simple gradient descent in a very weird space. So to be remembered, really, it's, it's an old idea in machine learning, artificial neural networks. But uh, over the last 10 years, it just exploded. I mean, when I, when I was a master student, we were already excited about artificial neural networks. But it never all these promises until the last 10 years. Just through a couple of tricks that we found, and one of them is to vectorize all the computations that we can export it to the GPU. So that's why now big companies that were doing graphics like NVIDIA are big, becoming huge players in deep learning because deep learning is done on the GPU. And it has been uh, responsible of lots of acceleration, really several orders of magnitude. OK. 
So that's for deep learning. This is a big thing which is fashionable now. Um, another way we have to look at, another way we can look at AI, which is particularly popular in my community of autonomous robotic and automated planning, is to make the difference between what is planning and not planning. So basically, planning is when you're trying to find a sequence of actions, and, the, and you're going to evaluate your performance as a whole sequence. So you could accept at some point to do something that is not so good right now, to, be, to put yourself in a position when you can get to something very good in the future. So this is, it contrasts strongly with the rest of AI, where we just greedily select one solution, it's, in the, it's evaluated individually, and you're done. Okay, so this is a distinction that makes sense or not. This is one way to cut AI, and it's a way that's important to me. And uh, it has to be considered like it's kind of orthogonal to machine learning. You could do machine learning for both. Okay, so if we do machine learning for the most standard AI, we get stuff like supervised learning and unsupervised learning. When you're gonna learn, these are these are two ways to learn from examples, like I just described. But when you go to planning and you want to do machine learning, either you can copy an expert. So this is making supervised learning. You, you, have a, you look at an expert and you look what he plays and you try to remember. In this situation, he played that, tac, tac. Same paradigm, we are doing supervised learning. But we also have reinforcement learning in terms of planning. And this is also the kind of naive image of a machine learning system. For, so that a little system which interacts with the environment and discovers the environment and receives rewards and punishment and we learn to behave just by interacting. And this is reinforcement learning. Okay. So, what is planning? We, we, see, we have all this for AI in XR and roughly, so this is the first time I'm making a bold claim in this talk, roughly, all the thing on the right is planning uh, on the left, sorry. Another thing in green on the right is not planning. So, not true. Dialogues are a little bit a sequence. Animation are a sequence. On the edges, what I'm saying is wrong, but I'm simplifying. Sorry. Okay? And here is a second big, bold claim of this talk. Machine learning rules over all the green. Let me argue. Machine learning rules perception. This is crazy. I know. But it has been like this for, from the beginning. We would think that uh, if we try to take the input from a camera and we try by hand to tell him if the pixels are like this, like this, you have a cat, we, we, never, we have never been able to make it. And AI has been able to make perception just by mimicking the way human learn, so, and not by trying to hack the decision directly. So perception is everything. Again, uh, it can be cameras, it can be text, it can be sound, it can be strange sensors that don't make sense to humans, like a LiDAR. So you can see these two pictures is uh, the view of the world from an autonomous car. So on, on the big one, you can see the car is in the black hole in the middle. It doesn't see itself. And that's what it, and uh, the small one, the LiDAR is on the front of the car. So that's, what the, that's perception. How do you make sense of that? Okay, machine learning rule data science. That's a small claim. This one is okay. Uh, so to illustrate this, I'm just going to tell you, just go on LinkedIn and check the job announcement. Uh, data science and machine learning, or, or go to Amazon and order a book on data mining and you're going to have only machine learning in it. Okay, so these things have been stuck together forever. Uh, and actually data mining is some form of perception in a sense. It's just that this, the, 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 the input is a huge, it doesn't come from a sensor, and it's a huge data, and you want to make sense of it. So that's an okay claim. This is a bold claim. Machine learning rule content generation. Um, some people will not agree. Uh, we actually have techniques to generate levels which are not machine learning. You have procedural techniques to generate animation. So I'm making this bold claim mostly for the promises that deep learning is bringing. And uh, I'm going to illustrate. The biggest thing, in my opinion, in terms of content generation that deep learning is bringing is side transfer. I think all of you have seen, seen this kind of picture. In these networks, we can distinguish the content from the style. Basically, the content is the activation of the neurons, and the style is the um, correlation between the neurons. 
Okay? So, and you can teach a network to get to a certain content with a certain style. So that's, that's what has been used. You take a photography and you can represent it in, you have all seen that. And this is pretty amazing in terms of content generation and creativity, honestly. And this has been done in pictures. This has been done in animation. So please, when you have time, click on this link. It's awesome. This guy is making, a, it gives you a content. So a guy is working normally. And then it shows you the style. You're injured. And, it, and, it, and it merge the two, and you get animation injured from a content of a non-injured. This is huge. Animations are expensive. They need mocap. They need a studio. They need actors. So if you can just record a set of animation in one style and then play it in many different styles, baby, uh, old man, that would be really a huge gain for the community. So, okay. If you can separate content from style, we can also add style to an empty, to a content. So this is pix to pix. Uh, from a map, it will make you an aerial picture. From a, day, uh, uh, from a picture in daylight, it will make you in nighttime. It will create a bag from a drawing. And look at this. This is really awesome, in my opinion. Look at this. You just describe your building in terms of big rectangles and the deep learning, boom. Generate this. The potential for this is absolutely huge. We could describe a city and then express it in any style. Middle-aged, modern, sci-fi, same building. So we Lots of the artistic work is done by the network in this example too. Okay. There is more. Uh, in Unity, so we are working on um, deep learning. We are researching on deep learning to create textures, removing the light. We take a picture of an object, and then there is a light, which is like we don't want the, light, the, the shadow on the, on the object so that we can extract the pure um, texture. And this is very hard. So we, we have been researching to do that procedurally, and now we are moving to deep learning to do that. I could mention many others, and I probably, some people are, oh, he didn't say that, but there were so many things. OK. Before um, I conclude on this machine learning thing, I have to mention Deep Dream. So this is a crazy picture. As I told you, learning goes like that. You give an example, you see how good the network is, and then you change the weight of the network so that you minimize the error. So you take a network, you learn, and then you make it dream. How do we, do we make a network dream? We give him one picture, process it to the network, give us a, some kind of activation of the network. And now we're going to maximize the activation of the network. We're going to make a little step to increase the activation of the network on this picture. But younger is that we're not touching the weights anymore, we're touching the picture itself. So we're going to modify every bit, every RGB gamma value of every pixel in the picture a little bit in the direction that would increase the activation of the network. So I show you a picture. The network goes into certain configurations. Then we change the picture so that the activation is maximized. So basically, in a sense, we are getting, we are showing a picture of the network, and then we are asking him, how do you see that picture? What do you see? These techniques kind of give you a little, glim a little glimpse of what the networks actually, how the networks actually see the world. And it gives, when we do that, we get that. This is really crazy. That's how a deep learning network can see a, a, a urban scene. And this is based on that, that it has recognition. It really recognizes a car on these kind of crazy things. That's how you recognize a car. So it's almost like looking through the eye of an ET that just arrived on our planet or in our universe. And, uh, which perceives the world in a completely different way, but it's not an ET, it's an AI. So we can play this game. Like I told you, a picture, change a picture to maximize activation we can do, of the network. We can also try to, oh, sorry, another example. <laughs> These networks have memory. So if you do that, you take a network, you teach it with pictures of dog, and then you show a spaghetti with meatballs, and you start to make it dream. You change the spaghetti with meatballs so that it, it, to make the network more active. You get that. Go on the web, it's really crazy. Uh, the number of uh, disgusting pictures of food you can find now on the web. <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy and funny. So this is done by maximizing the overall activity of the network. We can also focus on a given layer of the network and making 
maximize the activity of a given layer. So if we take the first layer of the network, we see how the world kind of divides the image. And we get this amazing artistic effect. Again, in terms of content creation, we can't pass on that. And we can also maximize the activity of a given neuron. Okay? So I give you a picture, and I take a neuron, and I change the picture so that this neuron becomes more and more happy. And we get that. Starting from a random, a completely noisy picture, and focusing on different neurons, we get that. Which shows us that some neurons have been specialized in recognizing Arctic shocks, turtles, pictures. And there is never a real turtle or a real picture. It's just picturey things, or tur turtley kind of features put together, and that's what the neuron, that's how I see the turtle. And uh, so if you come back to my first slide, sorry, I didn't repeat it, I'm going to do it quickly. You can do it on a movie, and, it, and you get that. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. The network sees eyes everywhere. You know why? Because uh, he uses eyes to recognize faces. So he's going to try to see eyes everywhere. And it's time he sees two big eyes together, he says, oh, that's a face. So he's trying. When you open your mouth, he's trying to maybe see an eye sometime in your mouth. OK, that's for deep learning and content generation. So if I return to my, uh, uh, uh. yeah, if I return here, I just told you machine learning rules, everything that is not planning, which is a bold claim, but OK. Let's look a little bit at planning. And in planning, I'm going to make one more distinction that's the last for today. So hang on. Basically, we, may, we, we can make the distinction between reactive AI and deliberative AI. Reactive AI is when you go and you hack directly the behavior of your entity. So this is basically, this rules the current state. This rules the current industry in terms of behavior, in terms of in games and VR. Almost everybody would go and write directly the behavior. That could be using, for instance, a finance set machine. So this is a very simple, very classical behavior in a game for uh, an NPC to chase you, he will wander, and when he sees you, he will chase you, and when you are in range, he shoots you. Okay? And I can represent this with a finance set machine. I can represent the same behavior with a behavior tree. I can represent the same behavior with a set of rules. I'm just hacking the same behavior in different languages. We see, oh, basically, almost all the AI, the game AI techniques do the same thing. Oh. Just different languages. Okay, so that's what we do with reactive AI. It contrasts a lot with deliberative AI. Deliberative AI, you don't write a behavior, you write a planning domain, you explain the problem, and you have an AI planner that gives you a behavior for every possible situation. So what I'm going to, obviously navigation, when you're thinking of navigation, it's uh, always a deliberative approach, we are making a map. So here the map is this blue probabilistic random map, incomplete, but that's a model. It's still a model of the problem. And then we run ESNA to find the shortest path. So we solve the model, and then we take the first, um, the first movement in this path, and we say, it's our decision. I decide to do that. So we decide by solving a problem and getting a plan. It contrasts strongly to directly hacking the solution like we were doing previously. Um, so navigation, motion planning is deliberative. And this is important to me. Um, many people will think that we can do planning only for the very low level tasks like navigation and motion, but it's not true. We have what we call classical AI planning. So this is, think of this like some kind of shortest path, but in this weird space. So I start in a state where uh, my NPC is in the woods. It has a key to the house. It's kind of tired. So it's gonna go to the house, use this key to open the door, enter the house, and then sleep. Okay. <laughs> okay, I have to rush through it. So I have a two-hour talk to explain why robotics went from reactive to deliberative. Uh, I can't do it today. Mostly, we had a problem in robotics. In 10 years ago, 20 years ago, people would try to make most of the behavior, even with an state machine, but we could never get to something that was complete. Um, I have seen the state machine of a very famous car company for going through a three-road intersection. It was like 2,000 pages of code, and it works only for one type of intersection. So just to go through San Francisco or LA, you need so many, many. And as soon as we change one rule, everything breaks. You have to redo everything. So now we do autonomous car with planning, mostly. 
Um, this I'm going to have to skip. I don't have time. Sorry for that. This is an argument to conclude about deliberative versus reactive. If we look at an autonomous car, roughly it would look like that perception, decision, and control. And as I told you, everything is perception now is on the, in the hand of machine learning. But if we look at decision more closely, we have a hierarchy of things, and the truth is, right now, most people are just one reactive, and all the rest are planners. And by the way, I don't know any car company which is using machine learning to actually make the decision. Okay, so machine learning is super present in perception, but in decision, no. And this is true for NASA too. Um, I don't have a slide to explain that, but uh, NASA has been using the same planner for many, many devices from International Space Station to Mars rovers to tiny uh, orbiter of the moon, Hubble, you know, if I didn't say it, whatever, plenty, and, uh, and the same technology. So this is reusable AI, and there is no machine learning in it, okay? Uh, as far as decision is concerned. Okay, so the real, rea the real AI revolution, this is my point, is not deep learning. It's deep learning and autonomous robotics at this point. Um, so we are aware of that, uh, okay? When you put deep learning with planning, you get AlphaGo. Sorry for the broken size. AlphaGo works a little bit like that. You expand the tree. This is a planning model, right? Because you can make a sequence of action, plan a sequence of action, and then you learn a bunch of networks. I don't have time to explain you how, but you're gonna use these networks like that. You have your tree, and you're gonna cut it. You're not, gonna, you're not going to consider certain actions if you have learned that they are bad. And then you have learned the value of state, you're gonna cut the depth. And then for the middle, AlphaGo is still using a planner. So AlphaGo would not trust machine learning on the very first steps. For what is critical, and now let's think again autonomous robotics or whatever, uh, we cannot check what the machine learning system is gonna do. It's a black box. So who would want to drive a car with a black box? In a planning system, you can represent all the obstacles, you can be sure that the orange part is very really tightened and you have everything represented, okay? All right, almost done. <laughs> AI research at Unity. So here's my point. We think that AI is key. We're gonna make amazing things, but if we don't have good behaviors, they're gonna be empty shells. Autonomous robotics and deep learning are the technology on which we must bet. Not the old school reactive AI, which is used everywhere in games nowadays. So we need to move from that. Unity is completely aware of that, and we are putting resources into it. And this resource, basically, with the hiring of Danny Lange, um, a rock star in machine learning, and myself, I'm not a rock star, but I'm in uh, autonomous robotics, so we have the two competencies. Both of us are hiring. Danny is constituting a very strong uh, machine learning team, and me, I'm hiring people from decision making and automatic planning. And uh, we're starting several research projects, so this is done in the labs, Unity labs, things I have been mentioning including a behavior planner, including a motion planner. So, as a conclusion, uh, I will be back to show you all that. <laughs> Come back. Thank you. Oh, guys, this is such a broad topic. Um, everything Nicholas presented was so awesome. And um, so I'm Boo. This is Adam. Uh, we want to try to tangibilize some of those concepts and how you guys can translate some of that into building projects with Unity for VR, but also mixing cognitive technologies and artificial intelligence. So at Snow Crash, we explore next generation experience design mixing always different technologies with partners from all over the world. And for the last seven years, we've been doing a lot of projects with institutions like Unity and MIT, Samsung, IBM, um, with all kinds of immersive applications uh, beyond games. And we always try to combine different technologies to try to stretch the limits of what is currently possible. Uh, we're here today to talk a little bit more about artificial intelligence and cognitive computing and how we think they mix in a, in a super awesome way 
with uh, immersive technologies. So if there's one thing we want you guys to take away from this session, is that there's an entire world of applications beyond games. And we want you guys to really get inspired and start exploring this vast world um, of immersive tech and AI. And so we're sharing a bunch of cases, some of our dearest cases with you. And part of the reason why you're here today was that in November, Snow Crash was invited to do an, an installation at the MIT Media Lab, uh, bringing our vision of possible future connections for immersive technologies. And we developed something called a cognitive VR experience in partnership with Unity and IBM. Um, so here's what we did. So, Hacking Arts is all about pushing the intersection of technology and the arts. What we really wanted is an inspirational project before people got hacking. And this project that Boo and Adam built inspired a bunch of people working on crazy VR, synthetic bio, design, fashion projects. And now today, we're looking at them and having our competition upstairs. So, that's why we're here. It all began a couple months ago when Adam Horowitz kind of invited us to do a VR installation here, stretching the limits of what is possible to do today with the technology. I knew Boo and Adam were experimenting with cognitive computing, with Watson, with virtual reality, with full body motion tracking, and they brought this crazy, magical, strange experience where you got to drink Van Gogh's Starry Night and drink fire and sit and you got surprised by actual real liquid entering your mouth in VR. We came up with this concept of a multiplayer uh, virtual reality experience with haptic feedback and warehouse scale tracking, a lot of sensors with a gorgeous scenario built by our friends from Lobo. Com um grau de detalhes, de complexidade do ambiente, de atenção a, a, a detalhes e minúcias, isso no contexto de realidade virtual não é tão comum, que é uma coisa que tem tudo a ver acho que com o grau de imersão que o visual ajuda a proporcionar. So we thought we, we could maybe spice things up a little bit. And so we began talking to our friends at IBM because we think they're doing awesome stuff with Watson and cognitive computing to solve real world problems. We wanted to mix those two technologies together and give presents to IBM's Watson. Hey Watson, what, what can, can I, I do, do for you? Tell me more about yourself. I am a question answering computer system capable of answering. Shut up Watson. Okay, I'll just shut up now. Like the whole role of AI is just to make our lives easier. To be able to feed data into Watson and use things like deep machine learning to solve problems and just creating machines that are smarter and more capable than us. Cara, é fantástico. É simplesmente único. É uma experiência única em um ambiente realmente místico a ponto em que o usuário se sente muito mais engajado se ele tivesse somente utilizando a computação cognitiva. A Unity é apaixonada por projetos que envolvem é, tecnologias inovadoras e novas formas de interação. É parte da missão da empresa democratizar o desenvolvimento de projetos que utilizam tecnologias fantásticas como Watson e realidade virtual. Basically, you're able to ask Watson about anything, and he's there at the bar, hanging with you, just chilling and connected to the entire world's knowledge database, <laughs> and that's amazing. I said. So it's no surprise that immersive technologies are widely considered the next computing platform, right? And that's not only coming from our own industry, but from, you know, kind of old dudes at Goldman Sachs, right? So uh, the way we see it is that immersive technologies are much like linguistics, and those are also cognitive technologies. Magic Leap always says that immersive technologies are rocket ships for the mind, and we agree with them. And it should be everyone's mission here today to use those tools to augment humans and help our kind evolve. And I like Ray Kurzweil often says, ask, uh, do more art, more science, ask more questions, more, more, more. Sorry. Uh, and by mixing immersive technologies with AI and cognitive computing, you release an awesome amount of possibilities. So take, for example, you're doing a Star Wars game, 
and you connect Watson with Wikipedia, the largest Star Wars wiki that we know of in this galaxy, and all of a sudden you have a character that knows everything about the Star Wars universe. Um, and it can speak with you in natural language. And of course, that's not only for VR, but AI connected to the real world via MR headsets. So HoloLens Cortana is already a good example of this and a step in the right direction. That's cool. But now imagine you're not working on a game, but um, an education or a science application in which you connect Watson and use the same exact skills to not Wikipedia, but large databases like clinicaltrials.gov and PubMed. And now all of a sudden, you can have students and doctors be able to speak with this AI and inquiry about cancer and biotechnology, drug interactions, et cetera. And if you make that multi-user VR MR, you not only have this awesome application, but an amazing work collaboration tool that connects our minds and augments them together. And we're really talking about work collaboration, education, scientific research, data analysis, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. And I really encourage you to start messing with AP, uh, Watson APIs and SDKs. I know there's one for Unity. Um, they're all uh, open, free, cloud source. So go and give them a try right now. You can try them for free right now. Um, I mean, we have no idea of the true potential of technologies when they're just beginning. Um, we always talk about lenses and how they were created almost 3,000 years ago to start fires. Um, they ended up revolutionizing biology by creating microscopy and medicine. They created cinema, astronomy. We have the Hubble telescopes and finally XR headsets. Um, Drawing a parallel, we think that immersive tech and cognitive computing right now, mixing with AI, they're at the level of making fire. So there's a lot of improvement in the next years. And yet, you can still do cool things um, right now. So we brought a couple of cases here just to uh, quickly go through some stuff that you can begin doing right now. Uh, one of the projects we're doing this year is helping engineers at Reno to have a more efficient and human-centric and smarter way, really, to collaborating overseas sometimes uh, to do what they do best, which, which is engineering. Not only do VR experiences with cars for advertising, uh, we believe we should help them do their actual core mission, which is engineer. Uh, so here's their engineering tier team, uh, led by Gascon Gaspar, is a vice president of uh, project engineering at Renault. And this year, we connected their creative labs transcontinentally from France to Sao Paulo to Curitiba uh, simultaneously so that engineers could validate designs and discuss modifications in real time and run simulations and do a lot of other stuff. Um, but that's not only for engineering. Uh, the same concept can also be applied to doctors. Imagine doctors discussing patients' MRIs or CT scans and discuss surgical procedures, for instance. Uh, we've been collaborating with a few uh, health institutions in stealth mode to achieve that. So far, we're only doing immersive tech on those areas, but um, you can imagine that if we mix radiology with VR or MR with AI, you open a bunch of different possibilities. So radiology today is already mixed with immersive tech and artificial intelligence, but separately. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but, but the biggest radiology service in the US right now is called VRAD. It is an online service, and since they have this large amounts of data, they've been using AI to generate insight for a while now. Um, there's no implementation yet mixing the AI with immersive tech, so that's one thing that you guys could maybe begin doing. Uh, Diagnostics and site generation, surgical planning are just a few of the possibilities. Um, we always use that keynote in every presentation. That's kind of cool that Dawkins was here this time. But <laughs> anyway, that's cool. Science really makes us evolve. And actually what got me into VR back in 2009 was a project at University of California called the Holosphere. Um, 
Do you remember the yellow sphere? <laughs> yeah. So it was a super expensive 360 degree chamber, basically to bring researchers together and close to their data sets to generate new insights. It's kind of like the Cerebro from the X-Men movies, but it doesn't use any headset. It's a 360 projection. Um, part of the reason why they built it is because visualizing and hearing and exploring those insanely complex data sets, they're just simply too much for 2D screens to handle. Um, so creating richer visual visualization uh, methodologies is essential for development of several super important areas of society, from, en from engineering to medicine and so on. Um, I want you guys to think about this. Allosphere was considered uh, extreme tech in 2009 by Scientific American. Nowadays, any one of you can have, even if you only have a Google Cardboard, that's kind of equivalent to, to what Allosphere represented in 2009. And that's huge, not only for science and education, but also for the immersive mediums themselves, because now we're mixing scientists, uh, we make them collide with artists and engineers and game developers, and a lot of different applications are gonna come out of this. And once again, I wanna invite you all to think about those possibilities, um, hear your call and deep dive into it. Um, Changing the world in a process, you know? So we have super tools like XR and AI at our disposal, and I feel like we should use them. <laughs> Unity is doing its best to democratize uh, development for those technologies, and that gives you superpowers to do anything. And when I say you can do anything, I really mean it. This guy here is Jack and Draco. This boy created a cancer detection toolkit using nanotechnology at age 15. Can you imagine what our kids will be able to do having access to super tools like immersive tech and AI experiences? So Jack opened his talk saying, have you ever experienced a moment in your life that was so painful that all that you wanted to do was just learn as much as you could to make sense of it all? I think that's a huge, that's a great point because it's not the love for algorithms that drives innovation, it's usually empathy. Uh, the algorithm is just the path, not the driver. I think behind every technological advancement in the world and every science breakthrough, there's always empathy and love behind it. Um, I too have been in a situation like that. I lost my mom to a rare kind of cancer after three years of fierce battle and from our fight, we learned a lot of different things. We found out we were living a renaissance in, in life sciences. Um, my mom's life expectancy, since it was such a rare tumor, was six months, but we battled for three years. And that's in huge part because of emergent technologies on the verge of biotechnology and information technology. Uh, we think, thanks to the digitalization of biology, uh, we're living this revolution in medicine and, and life sciences. And so one of our favorite projects is, it's my personal uh, little baby. Um, we've been using the power of immersive tech to translate the ideas of some of the brightest minds of our time to the general public. Um, stuff like how modified viruses are being used to treat cancer, saving lives. There's a story from Dr. Kraujun. Um, he's a doctor that modified an HIV virus to uh, modify cancer's T cells uh, in kids with leukemia, and he achieved a success rate of 90% in, in phase one clinical trials, which is one of the um, biggest success cases in medicine ever. Um, part of those developments, they happen because those researchers are using Watson for uh, discovery, and um, they're not only doing this for bioengineering, but Watson is actually being used to train uh, and to help doctors uh, at Sloan Kettering and other institutions around the world to give their patients the best possible treatment. Um, every life saved with those breakthroughs means another mom and another brother, another sister, and another grandpa with us for a few more years. So those are some of the subjects that we cover in the blank canvas. Um, stuff like how cognitive computing and AI are being used for genomics and research for insight and, and diagnostics. Um, 
In two days, we're going to go to MIT to do a pre-presentation of that project, and we're launching it on the 12th in Stockholm in VR SciFest, the first fast flow in the world, completely dedicated to science. And we're also talking to our friends from Steam, Oculus, and other partners to make those experiences available to many of you for free. Um, I would encourage you to stay tuned at FlagCX webpage to see when it comes out. You can always reach for us to, to have a beta session. Um, but guys, so that's kind of all we wanted to share for today. I think there's a lot of opportunities out there, and we really encourage you to take responsibility over some of those real-world problems and use those awesome technologies that are available to us today to make a difference. We're eager to see some of, the, some of those applications here next year at Vision Summit. And you can do it, and we believe you will. Um, I just wanted to say cheers for not going gentle into that good night, and now you guys go and do the evolution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one mic open in there if you guys have any questions. We're out of time. We are out of time, but we... Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're going to be here. Uh, we're going to take questions. Like, feel free to join us. Guys, thank you. Again, thank you so much. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, guys. Awesome. <laughs>